Uh, afternoon, everybody. Uh, today, I'm going to talk about uh, systems. Um, um, and if we're going to be talking about systems, then we'll talk about what is a model, and then more generally, what is science? These are quite weighty topics, quite pithy subjects I want to discuss uh, today. So, um, systems, how can we think about um, elements or bits of the real world, and in particular, the global challenges in terms of systems? Well, all you do, you begin to think about the real world target system as being comprised of things, such as elements, or bits, or items, or things. But the thing about a systems perspective, looking at things in a, in a kind of systems dynamics way, is that we're particularly interested about the interactions between these elements or bits or components. And they might be called interactions, they could be effects, or they could be connections. It's somehow the way that the individual elements of a system interact and affect the other elements of the system. And so when you have elements plus interactions, you have something which leads to systems behavior, or maybe even the system itself, or some system property. Sometimes the elements might not be very interesting, they might look quite boring. Sometimes the interactions might look quite trivial. The rules by which they interact with each other don't seem to be very interesting. But when you put those two things together, then you can sometimes get surprising, certainly non-trivially interesting things. So to demonstrate that, I'm going to give you an example, uh, something that you're all, you're all familiar with, I would imagine. Sorry. Um, and that's a central heating system. So you've all got central heating, have you? Or are some of you living in like really kind of derelict student accommodation where you don't even have a gas fire? I would imagine that you've all got central heating system, or you've at least seen a central heating system. And this is the bit that you interact with. This is the, the, the kind of the thermostat. And what you do, you set a temperature that you want your house or flat to be. And that is a component in a central heating system. So when the temperature goes below the temperature that you set, let's say you've set it at 20 degrees Celsius, when the temperature goes below 20 degrees, it sends a signal to a gas boiler, and it tells the boiler to go on. So the boiler starts to burn gas, um, it heats water, it then pumps that water around your house, and that hot water radiates out, it radiates its heat out through radiators, and then that increases the temperature. And that process keeps on going until the temperature in the house then reaches the temperature that you set as the fixed point on the thermostat. There's another kind of system that you can use to regulate your temperature, but this is in the other way, and typically we don't have much call for it in this country because this makes things colder, and we don't often have a situation where it's too hot. But this is an air conditioning system where, again, you set the temperature that you want in your house, let's say it's 18 degrees Celsius, and then if the temperature goes above that fixed point temperature, then the thermostat now sends a signal to this thing, which is an air conditioning unit. The air conditioning unit then cools the air temperature until the temperature comes down at below the fixed point, and then the system switches itself off. So, you can look at these things quite abstractly or conceptually, um, and in the bottom here we've got the, uh, the heating system. So you've got a variable, or some kind of system of interest, so let's say it's the air temperature, and then you've got some kind of object or collection of objects that affect the air temperature and they are affected by the air temperature. So, as the air temperature goes down, as it gets colder, this system reacts and actually makes the air temperature warmer. So this is the central heating system, this is the gas boiler and the radiators. And over here, on this one, we've got the system working in reverse. As it gets hotter, as the temperature goes up, then there's some uh, object here which affects the air temperature, which actually decreases it. So it, in this instance, it's the thermostat, which <coughs> is setting the air conditioning unit to come on, which then decreases the temperature. So you've got something which increases something, which then decreases something, or then something which decreases something, which then increases something. And so this is an example of a negative feedback system. Sometimes it, you, you may see it as just negative feedback, sometimes it'll be a negative feedback loop. The loop is an important uh, addition because there's got to be some kind of process by which one system affects another system, which affects another, and then it comes back to affect itself. So there's a kind of a loop, there's a causal loop. So, uh, in the example of the central heating system, uh, the gas ball in the radiators increase the air temperature, but then as the air temperature goes up, that has a decreasing effect on the central heating system because it will eventually turn it off. But you also get a negative feedback system uh, the other way, in the sense that this is now is the air conditioning system which is making the air temperature colder, um, and that process will go on until uh, it reaches its kind of equilibrium point. So, 
That's negative feedback. What about positive feedback? Imagine if you had a central heating system where rather than the thermostat turn the central heating system off, it actually turned it on. So the hotter it got, the hotter it wanted the boiler to burn. And the hotter the boiler was, then the hotter the air temperature went up. And you'd have B increasing A, which increases B. And th there's really only one way in which that's going to end, um, and that's the things measuring a set fire to your house. So the point to bear in mind when it comes to positive feedback, um, positive feedback stops either by some kind of negative feedback process interacting with it, you come along and maybe turn the thermostat off or turn the central, si central heating system off, or the system overshoots and collapses. So it goes beyond any notion of a kind of a fixed point or a stable point, um, and it self-destructs. Maybe it sets fire to your house, or maybe some other system uh, fails within it, and it no longer functions. So one of the readings I asked you to do for today was from a book called um, uh, Limp. Limits to growth. Was that the right name? Limits to growth. Right. Yes. Thank you. Um, the reason I wasn't sure is because there have been a number of books. There was Limits to Growth, Beyond the Limits, and then Limits Revisited. Um, but Limits to Growth was first published in 1972, and it was motivated or it was uh, it stemmed from the belief or the understanding or the increasing appreciation that lots of things in the Earth system, lots of things in our technolo technological civilization, seemed to be going in a kind of a positive feedback way, and it wasn't entirely clear what would be the negative feedbacks that would slow it down. And so in the absence of them, they were particularly worried that we may be in a situation where there could be some kind of overshoot or collapse. So on Friday, we looked at this. This is a, an exponential function. And an exponential function is a classic example of a positive feedback system because the bigger the function gets, the faster it increases. And the faster it increases, then the bigger it gets. And so certainly limits to growth was, was very interested in this exponential function, this exponential increase in the number of human beings there have been over the past 12,000 years or so. So some of you are studying geography, some of you are studying human geography, I think some of you have been studying demography. So you'll be, um, you'll be particularly experienced or you'll be well versed to pictures that allude to processes like this. So this is actually a system dynamics perspective on population growth. So in the middle, you've got population. So you've got some kind of uh, number of individuals. And then that will decrease and that will increase in corresponding to two simple processes. One, how many people die a year? So that's a decreasing process. And then the other one is how many, will, uh, how many births uh, per year? And that's an increasing process. So for a fixed number of population or fixed number of people, the deaths per year will change as a function of something called the death rate. And for a fixed population, the number of births per year will change as something called the fertility rate. So as people live longer or there are fewer deaths or fertility rate goes up or down, then these two processes will affect whether or not there's a decrease or an increase in the total population. So when the death rate equals the birth rate, all things being equal, then the overall population it will vary around, but over the kind of time scales that you're interested in, you won't see any change in the population. Now, when the death rate is greater than the fertility rate, then obviously the population is going to start to decrease because the number of people, number of babies being born, isn't sufficiently high enough to replace the number of people who are dying. And the inverse happens when the fertility rate is actually greater than the death rate, and then you can see growth. Now, this is the mechanism or the process by which there has been this exponential growth in the world's population. The fertility rate has led to more people being born than are dying each year, and so the therefore the population is getting larger, therefore the birth rate goes up, etc. Now the really interesting thing to bear in mind, and one thing that Jane Falking is going to talk to you about in her lecture, is that many people think that that explosive increase in the world's population has been largely because of this. People are having too many children, right? So as they have too many children, then uh, with the death rate fixed, as this goes up, then you have this kind of positive feedback process and where you're going to see exponential growth. But when you look and when you try to understand why there has been such a tremendous increase in the number of people on Earth, it's actually an important component of the death rate. The death rate has actually gone down in many examples, and it's the fertility rate staying fixed which has led to the increase in the global population. And the death rate has gone down because of increases in public health, you know, medicine, science, technology. What hasn't happened, or what is in the process of happening, is the fertility rates have come back down to a process or to a value which then equals the death rate. 
And as the fertility rate comes down and it equals the death rate, then we're going to see a steady state population again. So, <coughs> another way of looking at that process is a kind of a cartoon, but again, this is another example of a systems dynamics cartoon where you've got a stock of something, and a stock is just an amount. In this instance, it's the number of people. It might be the global population, might be a local population. It's just the number of things that you're interested in. And that stock is affected in two ways. There's a source, there's stuff coming in, and there's a sink, there's stuff coming out. And the thing coming in are obviously babies, and the things coming out are dead people. Um, and that's a through process this way. There's, uh, there's no feedback around there unless there are zombies that can reproduce. But let's just assume that babies are born, they go into the population, and a, a proportion of the population then dies. So there's a stock which is affected by a source and a sink. Now the little taps are meant to represent the fact that the inflow, the inflow coming into the stock and the outflow going out of the stock are subject to control, or at least they can change. So rather than people, you could imagine this was a bath, and so as you open the tap to let the water into the bath, um, if there's an outflow, well the outflow might be another tap uh, by the plug, or it might just be the plug, and so you can adjust the water level in that system by either increasing the inflow, let more water in, or decreasing the outflow, so the more water is in there that will typically stay in there longer, so the water level goes up, or the inverse, you know, decrease the amount that goes in and increase the amount that goes out. So there's an inflow and there's an outflow from a source to a sink via a stock. So that's a simple uh, process, and it massively simplifies all the complicated real-world things that go on when we're talking about population growth or population change in local communities, let alone the real world. Um, and so we can look at it like this, we can look at it like that. The process, the, the point I'm trying to make here is that a systems dynamics approach is just one way of looking at potentially complicated real world systems in a simple way. And often when we do that, we say that we're building a model of a system. It abstracts away or ignores lots of the real world complexities and it seems to focus on the particular things of interest. So you hear the word model or modeling a lot. Now, model in the first instance. Uh, this is a model. Um, it's a male model. And in a way, it's a bad example of what I'm trying to talk about uh, because male modeling doesn't seem to have a lot to do with uh, science modeling or even computer modeling. But in a way, it does. Because uh, Zoolander, the fictional character, uh, anyone seen this film? Okay, right. So. Um, he was meant to represent the archetype of male beauty, right? So he's almost the perfect uh, male. And that he almost kind of represents everything that's good or aesthetically pleasing about men. He kind of represents something that would be perfect about <coughs> maleness, or maybe even homo sapiens more generally. And the thing about models, uh, that models are meant to represent some kind of important features or characteristics of the target <laughs> system that you want. So this is a model plane. So when I was younger, I was a bit of a nerd, and I made lots of Airfix model kits, um, and they used to hang from my uh, ceiling with bits of string. And the point is, um, it's obviously not a real plane. I mean, this thing, the kit doesn't even fly, but it has some kind of properties of the real world system. It has the same proportions as a real Spitfire. You can kind of pick it up and turn it around. You can maybe play with it if you're very young. But the point is, it's meant to represent something. It's meant to abstract something about real-world Spitfires in a way which makes it easier for you to understand or at least appreciate. Now, the thing about models, we typically imagine them to have a, some kind of scale. So previously, that was a one, 1 to 24 scale. So this is 1 24th the size of a real-world Spitfire. But this Spitfire here is a 1 to 1 scale. So this is a life-size reproduction of <coughs> a Spitfire made out of a kind of plastic kit. Why would somebody want to do that? Well, it was a bit of a wheeze for a James May television show, but it again demonstrates the fact this isn't a real Spitfire, it doesn't fly, it's just too heavy, it doesn't have an engine. Um, it's meant to tell us something, it allows us to understand something about the real world system. So you could go up to it, you can look inside, you can look around it, you can understand its proportions, what it would look like under different circumstances. This is an architect's model. Architect's models were, I suppose, uh, they still are quite important when it comes to designing and proposing new buildings. Increasingly, we're getting used to CGI in films or even television, so there are very sophisticated and very clever ways of representing um, three-dimensional objects on a two-dimensional screen. But often, having a physical thing that you can actually look at and understand 
um, and see what it would look like in proportion to its surroundings allows us to have a deeper appreciation of what that particular design is. It's certainly easier to understand what that building's going to look like when it's a three-dimensional model rather than some kind of two-dimensional <coughs> picture or even worse, some kind of architectural plans, which to the layperson just wouldn't make any sense because they're all a bunch of numbers and lines and figures. So, the idea is that models are helping us understand something about some target system in the real world. It's abstracting away lots of things that we don't think are important with respect to the questions that we're interested in, and it's meant to capture the, the, you know, the salient features. And so, um, we can look at science as doing that as well. So, this is a picture of the night sky, um, and uh, for many years, uh, the planets that would wander around the stars uh, the sky, uh, was something of a mystery. Uh, in fact, planet is Latin for wandering star, I think. So the thing about when you watch planets over the course of successive evenings, they move around with regards to the background stars. And the reason they move around is because, as we know now, um, they orbit the, the sun, and so the relative positions between the Earth and the planet changes. But back when Tycho Brahe was making his observations in the 16th century, it wasn't known that that was the case. It was uh, a deep mystery as to why some of the stars seemed to be moving about. And what he did, he made a series of observations. He was a very, very good astronomer, and he made very detailed uh, observations of the positions of the planets over extended periods of time. And he produced a whole bunch of data, a whole series of measurements um, that were much, much better than anybody else's measurements up until that point. And he had his ideas about why the planets moved around, but he didn't really have a very good model. Because at the time, people thought that the heavens were composed of a series of kind of concentric disks, and the stars were kind of <laughs> points on the disk, and uh, different stars or the planets would move on different kind of disks, and it, it was deeply tied up to kind of theological, religious notions about how the heavens worked. And he couldn't figure it out. <coughs> but uh, a contemporary of Bray, uh, Kepler, actually did propose a much more successful model which accounted for why planets move around. So what Kepler did, he took Bray's really very accurate data and he realised that if you assume that the planets orbit the Sun rather than, you know, everything orbiting the Earth, but then also critically that they don't orbit in circular orbits, these kind of perfect circular orbits, but they orbit in these kind of elliptical orbits. So the Sun is at one end of an elliptical orbit and the planet will spend a long period of time away from the Sun and then it comes in close to the Sun, so these kind of ellipses. And Kepler studied along, struggled for a long time to understand why that would be the case, because he assumed that planets would orbit the sun in these kind of perfect circles, right? these kind of perfect spheres. Because, like Bray, Kepler was a deeply religious person, and he thought that there had to be some kind of perfect uh, symmetry or perfect harmony in the heavens. But when he tried to understand the data, the only thing that could fit the data were these circular orbits, uh, were these elliptical orbits. And moreover, he realised that there were some important properties by which the planets were going round. Over here, they'd be moving slowly, but over here, they'd be moving fast. So they'd slow and then quickly. So they go slow around here, and then they speed up when they go around the sun, and they, they slow down again. But the thing that was being conserved, even though their speed, their velocity was changing, the area that they uh, subtend, or the area that they make, so this area A2 here, this area A1 here, no matter where it is around the sun, the planet is always... Um, making the same kind of area. So over here, the distance on this line or this line is much, much shorter than over here. So if it moves faster around this point, it's going to make the same kind of surface area by moving very, very slowly around here. And once you put that into a model, then not only can you understand why the planets do what they do, but then you can make accurate predictions about where planets will be at some point in the future. You still with me? Good, right. So, <coughs> but why would planets suddenly speed up or slow down? Why do they have to conserve this kind of notion of area? Why can't they just have a constant speed? Or why can't they change their area uh, in any way they want to? And it wasn't until this guy, Isaac Newton, came along with these laws of universal gravitation um, that we understood why. What's happening when the planets are going around the sun is, yes, these areas are being conserved, but really what's being conserved is this thing here, which is the force. The force is being conserved, and in order to conserve the force, sometimes the velocity changes, right? So sometimes they speed up, sometimes they slow down. Um, but the thing that's always being maintained, the thing that is equal um, until some other process interacts or affects it, is the force that these things have. 
So we've got this little cartoon of the scientific method. And it is a cartoon, and many people would want to take issue with it. Um, but I think it's an interesting way in which you can look at it. So initially, you've got some kind of aspect of the real world that looks very confusing. We don't understand it. Somebody, fortunately, spends a great deal of time making detailed measurements of it. Somebody then used those detailed measurements to produce a model, some kind of representation, um, and it was a kind of uh, geometric model, certain aspects of mathematics as well, but it was mainly a kind of a picture that fit the data that was being uh, measured. And then sometime after that, someone very clever comes up with some kind of law or s mathematical relationship or mathematical theory which explains why that pattern fits that data. Okay. So in all of that, we've got this constant quest that you'll often hear is that um, Einstein's famous quote, even though I don't think he actually said this, um, but he said something similar. Um, in science, we should always try to make things as simple as possible, but no simpler. We want the simplest representation of the real world system that we want so that we can understand everything that there is that we want to understand about it, but we don't want anything superfluous. We don't want anything additional. We must kind of render it down to the very simple kind of mathematical formalism. That's great. Um, unfortunately, it doesn't work for things like this. Um, the global challenges are complicated. They're complex. And when you're looking for the kind of the reduction or production of very, very simple models that can explain and also even predict the behavior, then it starts to get very difficult. In fact, it becomes impossible because not only these big complicated systems, but they're interacting all the time. So you know, population is affecting biodiversity loss or habitat destruction, which goes on to affect energy security, and then transnational governance is in, there in a myriad of different ways. So there's lots and lots of different interactions. Um, and so it would be very surprising if someone's going to come up with some sort of law or theory which will be able to understand this system and then produce some kind of elegant predictions about its future state. <coughs> but even then, um, very simpler, uh, much, much simpler systems can actually surprise us and much, much simpler systems can be really, really hard to understand and predict. 